Education for All, a conversation with LGBTQ plus educator, activist, and model Lex Horwitz. Lex is a queer, non-binary, transgender, Jewish nationality, uh, recognized LGBTQ plus educator, activist, consultant, public speaker, and model based out of Philadelphia and New York City. Their work focuses on educating people of all ages and backgrounds on LGBTQ plus identities, topics, and issues through a multitude of pathways. Facilitations and workshops, lectures and public speaking, one-on-one -on -one support, and consultation services to name a few. Currently, Lex is a research co-investigator, consultant, and writer in gender-affirming healthcare at Temple University and Temple Health. Additionally, Lex works with higher ed institutions, nonprofits, and businesses creating LGBTQ plus curriculum and training, developing inclusive policy, producing educational resources, and providing feedback and actions to actionable steps to address areas of growth. So welcome, Lex. Thank you Joining so much. Lex, yes, thank you so much, Lex, for being here. Joining Lex in conversation, we have Marty Allen Cummings. Marty is an activist, community board member, gig worker, and drag artist running, running who ran for city council in Uptown Manhattan in 2021. Marty has been working in New York City for 13 years after moving to the city at age 17 to pursue a performing arts career. They know what it's like to make it in a New York living paycheck to paycheck and without insurance. For over a decade, Marty has been developing and deeply involved in community activating for LGBTQIA plus young people through the Ali Forney Center and aiding New Yorkers experiencing homelessness. Welcome, Marty. Take it away, both of you, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Mariella, and uh, welcome. Hello, good morning, good afternoon. Lex, it is so nice to, um, to see you and be joined by you. Uh, sorry, my dog is probably not me, not right now. Uh, um, so yeah. I had so to put my two babies away. <laughs> yeah, I have, I have my two dogs plus a friend's dog is here. So I feel like I'm Dr. Doolittle while <laughs> moderating our discussion. Uh, but I'm so excited to, to join you today. So can you start off, kick us off by just telling us a little bit more about yourself, your mission, and where you're, uh, uh, where you're based? Of course. So I am based in Philadelphia. And so as you all know, my name is Lex and I use they them pronouns. I am a queer, non-binary, trans Jewish human. And I work as an LGBTQ plus educator and consultant, activist, public speaker, model. Pretty much what I say is that whatever space professionally or personally that I'm in, I bring my authentic, unapologetic, true self. And I work what I can do to entertain and to educate folks uh, in whichever those spaces may be. I am an animal lover and cat enthusiast. So I knew that my two fur babies, my two senior special needs little loves will hop onto every call that I'm in. So I let them stay in their little room so they can take a rest right now. Um, I'm also an athlete. I, I am a Philadelphian, born and raised, went to college in Maine and came right on back to Philly. And I studied psychology and gender sexuality and women's studies, got my BA at Bowdoin College where I graduated in 2019. Awesome, um, that's so cool. Also, uh, shout out to Philadelphia. I grew up outside of Wilmington, Delaware, so love Philly. Uh, <laughs> Franklin Institute, woo! <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, that's so awesome. Um, and I also, I, I didn't start out by saying this, my pronouns are they, them, theirs um, uh, as well. I, I, I normally start out with that, but forgot this morning. Um, so yeah, so, so you had mentioned, um, you know, that you identify as a queer, non-binary, transgender, uh, Jewish person, and you take that uh, identity into every space that you, you hold um, unapologetically, uh, which is uh, so important and so needed, especially now we're living in this time where we're seeing what's happening in Texas and in Florida and, and in, in other legislators across the country. So it's really important for us to show up as ourselves, as representation in any space that we, we hold. So how do you, uh, with all of this that's going on, uh, how do you approach the concept of identity and how do you see the intersectionality of your identities informing um, uh, who you are? Yeah, absolutely. I. I see identity and 
language pretty much any way that we communicate with folks. So whether that's visually through our body language, eye contact, imagery that supports queer and trans lives or other marginalized communities. I see all forms and the ways that we speak with one another, the language that we're physically using to communicate, all are the most powerful and accessible ways for people to support any marginalized community, especially the LGBTQ plus community. And so having an identity that has been stigmatized or discriminated against in society, being able to bring affirmation for those identities and support and uplifting those identities through those forms of communication. So that's why my work as an educator and consultant is based in the power of language and in visibly standing in solidarity and advocating for queer and trans communities. And so it's centered in this idea of we need to come from this basis of affirming an accurate language and ways of communicating with one another so that we can respect and affirm and support everyone's identity. And so I'm also trying to touch on that, the mission from uh, that first question of yours and pull in identity at the same time, because my mission is education for all. I am so grateful that I get to work with different communities, people of all different ages and backgrounds, identities, from youth to our elders in having conversations on queer topics and identities and issues because it's everyone's, It's this is my belief and I, I hope that other folks share this, but it's my belief that every single person has the power and responsibility to be allies in action to marginalized communities. And my work specifically is at the intersection of queer and trans and other LGBTQ plus identities, but also knowing that as individuals, we contain so many different multitudes. So for myself, that looks like being queer, non-binary, trans, Jewish, amongst many other identities, those, and an athlete, those being the core aspects of how I understand myself and view myself. Also knowing that so many queer and trans folks who experience even higher disproportionate levels of discrimination or violence in so many realms of life are black and brown trans folks, are trans femme folks. And so that is not an identity that I have. And so I know that I can use my privilege as a white person in these spaces to provide support and uplift those folks with those identities. And so the intersection of identities is so critical to how the access that we have in spaces. So the spaces that I'm able to access given my, my background, my education, my experiences, and being able to support folks who may share some of the same identity labels that I do, but also come at the intersection of other lived experiences and identities. And we all can work together to really help folks harness that power that we all have to be allies in action to different members of the queer and trans community. Absolutely, thank you so much for touching on that. I think it's so important um, uh, that you highlight it. Everyone and anyone can be and should be an ally, you know, in, in all forms, you know. Um, uh, I just keep, you know, I'm, I'm bringing it back to this, but just looking at what's happening. I, we're living in really interesting times, right? Like you have like one half of the country is advocating to teach the full scope of history of our country and to educate people on, on the reality of what our country was really founded on. And how do we move forward from that positively making, um, our workspaces and our schools and our, our communities safe for, for, you know, our black and brown community, our immigrant communities, AAPI folks, you know, women, the LGBTQ um, people. And then you have the other half of the country who's saying, no, 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 don't teach that. There's that other, bill, not to bring it back to Florida, but you know, there's that other bill that's, that's um, <laughs> like, if you're uncomfortable as a white person, you can like sue, it's so silly. So it's, it's really important to use our identities to um, help educate people and to bring allyship to the forefront. So I just think that's so awesome that you're centering that um, in your work. And I want to talk about you. You 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 um, highlighted a couple times when you've been speaking that part of your identity is as um, as an athlete, which uh, is, is something I cannot relate to. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I, 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 I can barely, uh, run a mile, but I'm, I'm proud of you. Uh, but um, and running is one of my favorite healthy mechanisms of getting through life. I, I always try. run 
until I no longer need to. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll, uh, you'll have to come up to New York or I'll get down to Philly and we'll have to train or something. Um, <laughs> but, I, but I want to talk a little bit because, because you have talked about that being part of your identity, which I think is really cool. And so um, uh, you were on the varsity uh, men's squash team. And in doing that, you became the first out uh, transgendered athlete in all of collegiate squash and the uh, first out transgender athlete to complete uh, or to compete um, uh, at, uh, uh, how do you pronounce it, Bowden? Bowden. Bowden, Bowden, thank you. Um, so I'd love to hear a little bit more about that because that's another thing we're also, uh, which is very big in the news right now is, is trans athletes and where do trans athletes fit in? Um, you know, I, I, you and I know that they should be welcomed in the sports that they want to play, but that's not everybody's viewpoint. So so having that um, experience, um, uh, I'd love to just hear what that experience was like for you. What were some of the positives? What were some of the negatives? And how did you use your intersectionality to, to get through um, uh, that? Absolutely. And also one thing on effective ally in action before I forget, because it's also relevant to all spaces. So for trans athletes too, is that even members of the queer community are have the responsibility to be allies to other members of the community. So if you have a queer sexuality, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have the affirming language to be able to support and advocate for trans and gender expansive folks. And so this allyship for queer folks, for trans folks, is relevant even for folks who are a part of those communities as well. And so that's another kind of piece that I see as being really important for folks to acknowledge that we all, I also, identify and am a life learner. I know that there will always be something more that I can learn that I can use to grow and evolve as an individual and as a professional. And so my hope is that in creating the engaging environments and the judgment-free spaces, what some folks call brave spaces and having what can hopefully also be uncomfortable conversations where people ask questions that they may not feel they are able to ask in other spaces is to be, is to be able to really help folks be an ally, which is an action term, and be allies even in spaces where they think that they may already have done the work to be an ally. Because there's always going to be work that's done as language is constantly evolving, as we have more bills being passed or being threatened to pass that are going to have different, unbelievably harmful impacts on different members of the community. And so uh, an ask that I have for everyone is to also like see, view your life through the lens of being a life learner and being and wanting to, or not even necessarily want to, maybe challenging yourself to having those uh, challenging conversations or those uncomfortable conversations. And if you don't know who to have them with, please have them with me, because <laughs> that's something that I love to do. Because um, I also, do, I'm not in the, I'm not in the business per se of changing people's, changing people's beliefs or their values or their minds. I don't, as an individual, I don't have that power. And it's also not my responsibility, I want to be able to have conversations and respectful dialogue with people and hopefully be able to open minds and change perspectives in sharing my lived experience paired with my academic knowledge. But so if there are folks that wanna have those challenging conversations, I would like to just encourage you to do that because we can all grow and we can all get something out of that. Uh, and then hopefully along the way, some beliefs may change, some values may change, but that is the sole power of the individual. Um, so that was my little spiel on that. <laughs> Be an effective ally in action. We all have that power and responsibility. Um, and being an athlete, that is such a just key way that I understand myself and have lived my life since the moment I was born. I can't remember a time where athletics wasn't a part of my, my experience. Like I remember holding a tennis racket from being a tiny little nugget running around and I... I would not be able to separate who I am from being an athlete because the, the values that I've learned, the spaces that I've been in, the leadership, the kind of different core pieces, the determination, the hard work, the passion, all of what I've learned and kind of grown and developed through athletics has made me who I am today in a similar way that my identities as a queer and a trans person and a Jewish person, all of my experiences come together and those are the lenses that I see my, my world through. And so when I was choosing a college to go to, I wanted to be in a space where I would be both academically challenged and pushed as well as have the space to grow as an athlete because 
growing up as a three varsity sport athlete from middle school through high school, I knew that that was a part of my life that is unbelievably important to me. Uh, it provides community and self growth. And so when I came to school, I, when I came to college, it was my first year that I came to understand my, my queer sexuality. And then after I came to my queer sexuality, I realized that, oh, my gender, is it my gender presentation, my gender identity? It's not that I'm a masculine woman, it's that I am a masculine individual and gender binaries don't play a role in how I view myself. And yet I was the captain of the women's squash team while I was at, while I was competing at Bowdoin. And so I continued to compete on the women's squash team because I, they were my team, we were together. That was the experience that I knew. And I didn't actually know that I had the, had the opportunity or even the ability to be on the men's squash team because it wasn't something that was shared with me. It wasn't something that, oh, people now knew that I identify as genderqueer, as non-binary, but I wasn't told that, hey, is that, or asked, hey, is that team affirming for you? Would you feel more comfortable or affirmed in a masculine athletic space? And so I continued to compete on the women's team my junior year of college. And it was I knew that my mental health was being impacted by being on a team with folks who shared a gender identity that was so different from my own and hearing let's go ladies or all right girls and so many different gender terms at least five to 10 times a practice or a match or even walking into a locker room that had a stick figure of a feminine person wearing a dress versus a stick figure that's just a body. And so I I knew that for myself, I deserve to play the sport that I love and that it shouldn't be a choice to play the sport you love or be comfortable or be safe or be affirmed. I did the research that wasn't provided to me, but I did the research. I wrote a letter to our athletic director and said that my two options are that I get to play on the men's team because I can compete at that caliber and I follow the NCAA and the NESCAC rules to be able to compete on the men's team or transphobia gets in the way and then I'm not given the choice to have the opportunities that are supposed to be readily available to me. And my athletic director is an absolutely incredible human being and worked with me to be uh, to switch the men's team, to work on the physical spaces, what I needed from the team members themselves and captains and coaches. And I got to compete on the men's team my senior year. And so I'm unbelievably unbelievably grateful to have that experience. And a lot of the work that I do now in the education and consulting spaces is actually working with athletic communities in looking at policy and looking at physical spaces and the messaging that comes from the administrators to the captains, the coaches and the team members so that we can actually exist in these spaces where every single person has that opportunity to be affirmed and to grow because sports are a right for all people, which is of course being threatened right now. Yeah, I mean, that's so amazing. Um, uh, and that's great that you have an athletic director who was um, practicing allyship, you know? Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I thought, what, what was it like when you, like were your, were the teammates from both teams supportive or, or was there some like kind of inner workings that had to, like education that had to happen there as well. Yeah, it was, it was a combination. I definitely felt when I, I felt the men's team to be the most affirming space for myself. Um, I think it had to do with a combination of no longer hearing gendered messages that were on the feminine side of the spectrum. Because as an individual, although I don't identify as a woman, I also don't identify as a man, but I do feel connected to masculinity. And so being in a masculine space was extremely affirming to me. And I still remember that when I sat down with, first with the, let's see, it was first with the coaches and then it was with the captains and then it was with the women's team and then it was with the men's team. So we had a series of different meetings where I shared that as a leader of the women's team, I cared about my teammates experiences and supporting them, but that for myself, I needed to be on the men's team. And then that was something that I was hoping to have support going through. Um, and I remember the men's team made, they just fully were around in a circle. They were just like, yeah, that 
that makes sense. I like got pats on the back. They said, welcome to the team. I did get a couple, not me personally, but I did get a couple of questions like, well, what does this look like for community members that use the courts in navigating physical spaces, um, which is all something that needs to be addressed. Like how can we all exist in a physical space in a way that is safe and comfortable for all people? Um, whereas the overarching just feeling was that I was, I was able to move into this space that was where I deserved to be uh, and compete for that last year on those teams. Um, I did experience uh, some challenges with my coach uh, throughout this process. And so I chose to go through my athletic director who I knew was unbelievably supportive and helped me navigate every single aspect of this transition to different to this different team. Um, yes, and there are there are so many stories that I have about my my experiences in athletics, um, and that's why I I do what I can to do trainings and workshops and host conversations or moderate different dialogues within athletic spaces because I can share my personal experience and the challenges that I've experience and overcome to the triumphs that I would just want to have other trans athletes experience as well. And then also coming from the experience that I don't identify as a man and I played on a men's team and how that experience was the affirming experience for me versus playing on the women's team. Um, there are so many small to large aspects that go into affirming trans athletes from the roster, the name that you put on the roster. Do you have the person's affirming name and do you put pronouns for every person? Do you call your team a women's or a men's team or do you call it the squash team? Do you change physical spaces to make them actually more comfortable for all people like getting rid of the spaces between doors that shouldn't be there in the first place? Do you add curtains so that all people, not just trans and gender diverse folks, feel like they have the opportunity to get changed or to just be, have access to more private spaces. When you're traveling, what hotels do you stay in? Do you make sure that you only go to, only compete against schools that are in states or at schools that have policies for trans oh, inclusion? Yeah. There are so many different pieces that go into creating a safe environment for trans athletes that I was actively advocating for and working with my athletic director for traveling for, for the, our, we went to go get food. We had to sign off our names on a sheet and getting my affirming name on that sheet, making sure that my coach knew that that was a priority. So many different moving pieces in creating these spaces. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for, for sharing that. Um, we have a couple of questions in the chat. I want to, I want to jump off of my the script that I have here and get the, the folks as we're, we're um, uh, coming towards the end. So I want to make sure we answer these folks' questions. Um, so uh, Ebony asked, uh, are there any resources to help me become more gender friendly and use pronouns um, better? Uh, and I'll just quickly say um, uh, uh, before uh, you jump in, Lexa, just going to say that my experience with this, you know, because I use they, them pronouns. And uh, so I do I do drag also for a living. So people are like, well, what do I call you when you're in drag or when you're out of drag? What, you know, but I, I always think it's like um, helpful when you are in a space to just introduce yourself with your pronouns and that opens it up for the other people to say, okay, great. Well, these are my pronouns. And then just like move from there. And also, as you mentioned um, very beautifully when you were talking, language is constantly evolving. Language is forever changing. You know, it took me you know, until I was in my thirties to say, what is that missing piece? You know, the same thing. I don't, I don't identify as a male or a female. So when I came out at 14, uh, as gay, because that's the language that I knew, I still felt this weird, like there's something still not lining up here. And it took me until I was in my thirties. Uh, but that was because it took language that long to evolve. So, so I think it's just, you know, if you make a mistake with the, if you accidentally misgender somebody or something or whatever, don't like be bamboozled, just, you know, in the moment, you know, okay, I, I apologize, you know, and, and, and move forward positively, you know? Yes. And I'll just tag on to that because I would also say that I know from my own experience and let me know if this is the same for you, that it has to do with having access to the affirming language and also the safe spaces to be able to access and acknowledge internally those aspects of your own identity. Because I knew that I had, I didn't have that safe environment where queerness wasn't, uh, and I say this 
in the literal sense, and it's quite intense, but where queerness wasn't a social or literal death sentence in spaces. And it was in college where I saw queer people existing as their authentic true selves paired with having the language to see that gender isn't a binary, sexuality isn't a binary. You can live and have a life and be successful as a queer and trans person. So it took both the language and that environment to be able to, I always say that there's coming out is actually two separate processes that continue to happen. There's that internal coming to your own identity. And then there's that external sharing your authentic self with other people. And it has to do with having that language and that space. And so ways that all people can engage in affirming language and practicing pronouns, um, I always say that the education continues. There are so many resources that exist. There are so many different uh, resources that break down and define the different language terms. There is a website, I believe called Minus 18, where you can put in different pronouns and you can practice them in all different forms of sentences. Um, on my website, I have a list of a range of different resources that folks can use to engage in activities, in videos, in language. And something that I always love to just share with folks uh, is that as an educator, my hope is to bring folks together, meet them where they're at, and to dismantle their current understanding of gender and sexuality and to rebuild it together in more accurate and affirming ways. And so a lot of times that looks like taking apart gender, which is three different component, different identities that are commonly misconflated to be the same. So you have gender identity, gender expression, and sex, which is sex assigned at birth and current sex identification. And really acknowledging that these three different identities have different definitions, they have different terminology. And so when we're talking about gender identity, it's someone's internal concept of self, something that only they know, we can't place that onto another person. We're using those gender terms, woman, non-binary, man, gender queer, agender, two-spirit, and so many others. We're talking about gender expression. We're talking about someone's physical way that they navigate space. So their external appearance, hair, mannerisms, behavior, just to name a few, masculine, feminine, androgynous are the terms we use for that. And then for sex, someone's sex assigned at birth is typically only based off of the appearance of their external anatomy, but their sex is actually a combination of bodily characteristics, which include chromosomes, hormones, internal and external reproductive organs and secondary sex characteristics. So having these three different, three different identity categories that all come together to create the diversity of existence that we know today, we can't make those assumptions. And so that's what Marty was saying with introduce yourself with your name, with your pronoun, because we don't know someone's pronoun just by looking at them. Yeah. By looking at them, we have this tiny little snapshot of what their gender expression is in that moment, which may be different if they're in more active in, their, in more affirming spaces. And so if you wanna know someone's gender identity and how to affirm them, that language is specific to them. The language that's affirming to me as a non-binary person is going to be different for other folks who identify with the term non-binary who may define that gender identity term differently for themselves. And so it's about being involved in this active conversation of what's the affirming language? What does that mean for you? And how can I do that? And we all make mistakes. And so coming into spaces, giving yourself that grace, knowing that that does not make you a bad person. We are all learning. We're all We're growing. We're all learning. Yeah. Yes. All learning in We're these spaces. We're all learning. And that, that ties us <laughs> to the, um, we, we have to wrap up in one minute. But somebody in the audience asked, um, is education only for the young? Well, I, I think what we're talking about right now shows that it's not. We're constantly, no matter your age, learning and growing and evolving. So education and education around these topics is, is um, ever present, ever changing and for all ages. And to wrap it up, the last question that we have from the group um, from Joe Ellen says, do you believe today's LGBTQ plus leaders, influencers value um, LGBTQ uh, plus elder voices and how do these elders contribute to today's LGBTQ conversations if younger leaders see them as no longer relevant? Um, uh, uh, I, I mean, I look to like, like I, I look to, to leaders like Jose Saria, who was as a, a political drag, somebody who does drag and ran for office. I look at Jose Saria, who was the first openly queer person who ran for office in this country in 1961. Um, and so I think their voices of course still matter. And we look to them uh, with reverence, but also knowing that as language and time changes, um, it's okay to say at that time that was okay, but now we're moving uh, in a new um, direction. But we do have to wrap up. So Lex, do you have any thoughts on that uh, question there? Yeah, so I think that it's unbelievably important to acknowledge our history and where we are today because we would not 
no matter what space you're in, we would not have the ability to understand our identities without the work that was done by our elders. And so I know for me personally, that is unbelievably important, acknowledging our history and where we are today. Um, and I would hope that everyone is able to not only acknowledge, but to celebrate and cherish the folks that have done the work for us as we continue to do that work, because everything has to do with collaboration and community. We are always stronger together there. We can hopefully help to change the world and make a positive impact by coming together uh, because we all have our own skills and talents and that just bring that all together and we can be the positive change that we want to see. And so that comes from acknowledging everyone and everyone's power. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Lex. Um, it's been wonderful chatting with you today. And thank you everyone for listening. Uh, and thanks, Power to Fly. Have a beautiful um, day. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lex. Thank you, Marty. Love all the gems you all dropped. Yes, Lex, did you want to say something else? Yeah, I just want to say, so for folks that are looking for educational resources, um, if you would like to find some on my website, it's www.lexhorowitz, L-E-X-H-O-R-W-I-T-Z.com. Also, Google can be your friend. There are so many resources out there. Please feel free to contact me if I can help in any way. It is such a honor and pleasure to do the work that I do and to be a part of this space today. So thank you so much. I am so grateful. Thank you. Thank you both. All right. Enjoy the rest of your day.